There's many reasons why I fight, but when it comes to fight night, the only thing I'm looking to do is cause damage. Because the Mike Ricci that fought in Titan so far has been vicious, an assassin. My name is Mike Ricci, I'm 28 years old. And I've been fighting professionally for the last seven years. I'm fighting out of TriStar Gym in Montreal, Quebec. Coming up in the fight game, you gotta be raised properly. You don't wanna be put into fights you're not necessarily ready for, you know? Yeah. But but that's the game. Like my if you look at my career, like after my fourth fight as a pro, every single person on my record is in the UFC or Bellator. Yeah. So I, I never took easy fights, you know. I, that was not never For my sure. style. But some guys, you know, they could be discouraged by losing. You know? Like when I lost to Pat Curran. Yeah, you were young. I was young. I was 23. And uh, yeah, t t 23 turning 24, something like that. And uh, when I lost to Pat Curran, that was my first loss out of all my amateur and professional fights, you know. That was a, a really a defining moment for me. Like after that fight, like I, I didn't fight for a whole year. Yeah, you stayed at home. Yeah, pretty I, much for a year. I had a, that was probably like the the darkest the darkest time of my life for sure. I I lost that fight, and I think looking back, I I must have been I must have been ashamed. I must have been embarrassed. You know, I I was getting so much hype off that fight because everyone was looking for the next George St. Pierre you know and I was undefeated I was 5-0 and they put me in this promotion and I was everywhere man like every newspaper every magazine you went into Concordia or McGill those, they'd be like those you know those papers that like yeah. you get as a student like, did you go to university? yes I did okay it was McGill, it was McGill. you were at McGill yeah. great because um, you, were, you did start training at 20 so I thought maybe I needed yeah. to fill in the gap yeah so I mean what were you in? sorry to interrupt uh, I was in uh, entrepreneurship program. Well, you certainly dressed like one today. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like that. That I was all over the place, man, and I, I blew my head up, you know. And I was like, uh, they were calling me Kid Canada and this and that. And then when I lost, it was like I, ha I, I, I really didn't handle it well and take it like a man I really didn't I, I went and you know I moved into my mom's basement and I just like didn't get out of there for a year wow I I had a really rough time man I battled drug addiction throughout that year like I I hid it from everyone in my family uh, and it was really for me it was rock bottom and I was I lost tons of weight I was like 165 pale, you know, I didn't cut my hair for a year, like, I was really just like... Not Mike Ricci. No, I was not in a good place, and it really happened gradually, like, you know, I, I started by going out and party, so I'd go out and I'd party and I'd drink with my friends and smoke weed and do stupid stuff, and then I noticed that that would make me feel better, and then I kept doing that and doing that and doing that, but I would feel shitty during the day and throughout the week, you know, and I would only have fun on the weekends, and then I realized, well... Why don't I just drink, you know, smoke weed and, and do this and do that and, and, you know, during the week or during the day. Just suppress you know, everything. Just, yeah, right? I'd wake up in the morning and start drinking and I start doing stupidity and that led, obviously, you know, to other stuff, you know, it's the gateway to, to other drugs and, and whatever. And before I knew it, like, I just wanted to be high all the time, you know. Like, I, I, all of a sudden, I started to have, like, a new circle of friends around me, guys who were always down to just party and get high and be stupid. But, uh, Not working all the time. No, I didn't. Like I didn't work for a year. I didn't right. do anything. Like I literally, right. you could hit these guys up at eleven thirty in the morning, and they're over, and yeah, it's all good. They're down, you know. And like I found, like that started to to become the forefront of, of what I was doing, and I, I hid it, you know, from my family until one day, you know, my dad sat down with me, and he realized that something was wrong, you know. Yeah. And he knew it was the it was the fight. Yeah. And he said to me, son, you know, he says you don't have to be a fighter. He said, but you can't go out like this. You can't have this be your last fight, and that's your legacy. Even if it's one more time, you have to fight. Right. And it just it made sense to me, you know. It, it snapped me out of what was happening. How did that feel for you? Because obviously your father supported you throughout that whole year and watched you kind of destroy your life, in yeah. a sense, and take away a gift that you, that you earned, right. you know? 
and that you even say that you were born with as a gift, we'll say. Um, how did that feel when your father looked at you and was still able to support you on all your endeavors throughout all of the negativity? Well, he, you know, at that point, like, I mean, he was always my biggest fan, you know, and for him to to support me at that lowest point, it, it, it's what woke me up, you know, and I I said, all right, you know, like, I, he's right and I got to get out of this, yeah. this slump. And I hadn't seen any of my friends from the gym. I wouldn't answer Faraz's phone calls. I wouldn't answer Rory's phone calls. Okay. I literally had no friends who trained. Like, I completely was away. Like, everyone even stopped calling me. I mean, after six, seven months, like... It's like, okay, what are we yeah, going to do? Knock, and nobody yeah. knocked on your door yeah, or anything? Alex Garcia, like, after a couple of months, he just came and banged on my door. Like, and did you answer? Yeah, I answered the door. He's like, hey, what's going on? Da, da, da. He tried to, like, get around me, bring me back to the gym. But he realized I just would, like slip away you know and yeah yeah okay I'll come and then yeah. like just fall off the map so eventually everyone has to carry on with life and also your mentality now has a lot to do with that because of you know not watching as much tape and putting so much pressure and family you kind of just try to tunnel vision and zone out now yeah and I've always been a, a you know I've always been a you know a bit of a loner my whole life you know I never really had too many friends I never really was out a lot of social stuff you know like uh, and and it, when I got into to MMA, that started to change. People were around me a lot, and um, you know, when I got into the UFC, it was like so many people around me. Like my the first anxiety attack I ever got was when I was home, came home from Ultimate Fighter. There were so many people that I was just like, I kind of like started to feel nervous. Like, yeah. And I think that getting back to you know being by myself. You know, that's where I flourished the most. Like, I did so well on The Ultimate Fighter because I was all alone, you know. I didn't really open up to anybody there, any of the fighters, any of the coaches. I really just stuck to myself. Right. And and now that I'm doing that again, I'm a whole different person. Three days in a hotel room for me, you know, before I fight, like, I literally am a different person, man. Like, like I said, I land, I sit in my room, and, like, three days in, it's like I'm completely like 100% like militant military mode and it makes a huge difference right man. huge difference so you would say it's like TV shadow boxing weight cut not hydrate. even I, I don't I don't my coaches freak out like I don't even train the day the week of the fight like I literally land in Florida and I don't move I literally sit in my room when it comes time to cut weight I sit in the bathtub go on the scale come back sit down do nothing even the day of the fight I don't train I don't like nothing, no stretching. And you did that even in the UFC as well? No, the UFC I was more like training throughout the week and stuff like my Miles Jury fight was I was like worn out to the bone. Like a guy who usually rehydrates up to one eighty, I was only like one sixty eight when I wow. fought Jury, yeah. I was like and when I cut weight I cut to one fifty three. Like I was just like Seriously. Yeah, I was so small, like and I did like a twelve week training camp. So, like, I was ready to fight him, like, four weeks, five weeks before the fight even happened. And that gets frustrating. Yeah, When you're was, ready to go. That's, a month extra is, is a long time. Yeah, and I, I learned that, like, you know, sometimes more is not really, more is not always better, you know what I mean? Right. It's, it's not, like, so now i found the time, you know, six weeks for me is perfect. By the end of the six weeks, like, I'm raring to go and I'm still full of energy. Uh, and the week of the fight, I don't do nothing. So when it comes time to fight, like, I have so much built-up energy. Like, my body is just dying to move, right. you know? It's, yeah. So. And you're keeping your diet clean so you don't feel like crap. Yeah, that's you're right. Like, my diet's gotten a lot better, you know, over the last the last year. And uh, and even this, this, this weight mishap, you know, people think, like, oh, like, he was eating cheeseburgers and he was this and that, like... And I was following my diet to a T. Like, I really Absolutely. think it had a lot to do with hormones and the fact that I was, you know, back-to-back -back weight cuts. So that's really all I think it was. For sure. On The Ultimate Fighter, you, you know, you use words like being institutionalized and some psychological damage and, and stuff like that. Um, would you say it was more of the fact that it was very militant, get up, train, go to bed, refuel? Or was it more of the guys that you were around? Because you were around some uncomfortable people. You yeah. know, as Canadian as Michael Hill is, he's sometimes an uncomfortable person to be around with his temper, and yeah. you have your goal and he has his, and he wants to shatter your dreams at the end of the day. I think that, uh, 
like I'm a really intense person and everything I do is 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 a hundred percent and like there's a lot of extremists out there but like I'm really like the definition of you know I, I really am super extreme with everything I you do. You do things with a purpose. Yeah, always. yeah, and, and like I, it seems like everything I do when I decide to do something, like nothing else matters. You know what I mean? Absolutely nothing. It could be as simple as watching a football game, man. I'm watching the game like that's all I'm doing. I'm into this game. You know what I mean? And I'll be like, a player will make a catch, and I'll like Google him, and I'll be like, okay, where, what school did he go? What university did he play at? Okay, okay, what's his stats? So how tall is he? Like, like I just get so into right. what's going on. Like, yeah, this is how I am. You know? Yeah, because when we were texting you know I I, re I then checked on Twitter and you were like I'm cooking and Cajun's like so am I so I was like oh I'm interrupting him and now that you say how you are with a purpose and I know that obviously you take pride in your cooking because your mother has taught you that yeah it's it's a big deal to you and uh, I think that's very interesting you know how you kind of take everything to heart mm -hmm. and that that adds a lot of value to it it shows that you have a lot of respect for other people's crafts and right correct and that's why I think the show was was you know uh, it affected me so much it's gonna affect you no matter what no matter who you are when you go into that show it's gonna affect you for better or worse you know and, and it'll change you but it's such an intense experience and I'm such an intense person that like it really like it got to the point where like four or five weeks in I could have lived there forever man I could have literally stayed there forever like and just fight every week fight every week fight every week I didn't care like for me like I became so a part of that system right you know and, and I embraced all of the, the the negative and positive aspects of it man you know the the, the aggressiveness the the heated environment we were in and, yeah. and stuff so when I got out it took me some time to like settle settle down a bit you know yeah. that's why I you know I made those comments in, in the interviews like I feel like psychologically it kind of twisted me up a little bit put me in a different place but I mean now that it's over with you know I, I, I look at it like now I look back and, I, and I'm like oh it was a great experience it was part of the journey you know it was, yeah. it was fun it was this it was that but in, when I was in it I was in it man and I think that's why I, I got to the finale you know there was guys that were a lot bigger than me they had more credentials than I did but nobody was in that game the way I was you right know? guys were they, they were having their ups and downs and they were you know missing home and you know I don't want to cut weight again and yeah that. there was a lot of a bit of drama with alcohol and yeah, stuff some yeah, guys exactly. you know uh, you don't even hear about those guys as but, much but nothing nothing you know deterred me from what was going on absolutely I would have died to, to, to win that show. to win that show I don't think anybody else was at that point and so when I decided okay I got to turn my life around I walked into John Chamberg's gym and I said John I need a job I don't have like any money I don't have anything like I don't know what I'm going to be doing I just know that I need to start working and being around someone positive yeah so he gave me clients and I started training them I called Rory after not talking to him for I don't know how long and it was how like was a that? random Wednesday afternoon and I was like Rory what are you doing he's like oh man I'm just chilling having lunch I go grab all your sparring gear let's go to the gym so the first time I stepped into TriStar after like almost a year me and Rory geared up we went in the cage and I'm like we're going to do three five minute rounds and like that's it we're going all out he's like okay after the first minute I was finished and I did not stop I let Rory beat on me for three full rounds wow round after round literally to the point where I was standing in the corner of the cage like just shelled up and he was just beating just on me just taking it but I said I'm doing three five minute rounds no and I only what. had the gas to do one minute and <laughs> wow and after that was done I was like alright I'm ready to get back I wanted to fight and that, when that was done, I looked at Faras and I said, there's a fight in, there's a show in the, at the Bell Center for ringside in seven weeks, or eight weeks. I said, I want that fight. And Faras didn't really like, he didn't really know how to approach me because like he knew I might just disappear. Yeah, it was a yeah. whole year. Yeah, you so didn't... he was a little bit standoffish, but he, he you know, he, he booked me the fight and I fought, I fought Jesse Ross. And that was my return to... MMA. Wow, what a story! Yeah, it was, that's crazy. It that, was uh, it was wild. I've that, never never told anybody this. Well, I appreciate that. And do you think that's uh, definitely one of the most defining moments of your career? I think so. I think it was it was what that what I learned in that year and what I built. You know, like as far as like being able to persevere through it and overcome it. Yeah, that transitioned into my fighting a lot and that's made me a lot stronger as a fighter emotionally like 
it's taught me to never quit and never give up. You know, no matter how far back you've, you know, you, you you've been set back, and so uh, I think that all that's made me it's made me strong, man. Like it's really it, it's made me a different person completely. Like I, I almost lost my life, you know, and and like looking back, like it seems so stupid, right? It seems like okay, well, you lost the fight, whatever, but. For me, it was my world came crashing down, and like I, I, I went with it, and I'm really upset on, at how I handled that situation, and I've lost since then. You know what I mean? And it's never deterred me ever. Like I told myself, I'll never let that happen again. Right. So I learned the hard way, but it's made me, it's made me mature, man. That year, I learned, I learned a lot from it. So. Was it tough to gain the respect of old teammates? It was very tough. Even Alex. Yeah, I, I seen guys were, I mean, they welcomed me back, but I could tell that they, you know what I mean? He, could, he might fall off at any moment. They were upset, you know. That was tough for you. Yeah, it was it, it was hard. And, like, you know, I remember, like, running into certain guys and, like, at a wedding I ran into Eamon. And this is, like, midway through what I was going through. You know, I was such a fuck-up. Like, I showed up three hours late to my own cousin's wedding. Eamon was there and I hadn't seen him in four months like we were having you know a few drinks at the bar and he looked at me and he like put his arm around me and he's like he's like man I miss you so much like you know he's like you gotta come back like you gotta come back to the gym and I looked at him and I was like man like I'm not ready I'm not. like and then after that like he never called me you know, he never bothered me again right. he knew I wasn't ready yeah. it wasn't right right and uh and it was tough for him. He, he, you know what I mean. It hurt him a lot. He coached me through everything, you know. And yeah. And so I think he took it hard. But everyone eventually opened up to me. They saw me working hard, and I work hard in the gym. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I'm dedicated. So when they saw that, like, they saw me take the fight, you know. And then I took another fight right after. So they were they were behind me. You know, they knew I was back. And like where I was at mentally and emotionally was just. It, it was. It, it's a place I'm never going to be again. Like, I'll right. never let myself get that low again. I don't know how it happened. It was a slippery slope. But, you know, I let a lot of things happen to myself that I shouldn't have. You know, I wasn't a man about what happened and I didn't make the right decisions. But I learned from it. And that year, like, it was a defining moment in my life. Like, I learned a lot from it. You know, I have lessons that I've learned in that year that I could teach other people too, you know, that I can, yeah. you know, and so... And, and I was when I knocked out Neil in the Ultimate Fighter, I saw him packing his bag and I saw him nervous and like I thought about what happened to me. Like I was in a tournament in Bellator tournament, I got knocked out, you know, and I was young and I, and, and he was too. And I like not to say he's the same person as me or he would have the same outcome, but you could feel for like, it. Yeah, and I came to my mind like, man, I, I, I quit for a year, you know. And I, I walked up to him and I was like, you know, Neil, like, man, I got knocked out and I quit for a year. And I let myself, you know, fall fall back. And, like, I, you know, I put a, the brakes on my career. I said, man, this is a learning experience. And you're going to get a lot better from it. I'm like, don't do what I did and, just, and take a year off or two years off. I didn't tell him the specifics. I was like, don't quit, man. You're, you're a great fighter. Yeah. You know? And keep, keep moving forward and don't take a day off. And you were right. And I was. And he, you know, I, 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 hope, I feel like that helped him, you know. I feel yeah. like it did. I feel like he... he, he he didn't quit and he didn't take time off or reflect on, on any. He just like kept pushing, you know. You know, when I went from being a fan and like going to TKO events and like sitting in the crowd watching guys like Fabio Holanda and Sam Stout and all these guys, like I was just like I have photos of you know me and Sam Stout. Like I I run up to him and be like, Yo, can I have a photo, man? Yeah. Like, and I'm like 18, 19, and I'm like taking a picture with Sam Stout. Like I was really a, a fan. Now that you're a UFC guy, is that weird when someone wants to take a picture? Is it like you're interrupting me or you don't care? I, I don't mind. I think it's cool. You know, yeah. I feel like I'm getting recognition for what I'm doing, which is always a, a good feeling. But to go from that 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 transition from you know being a fan to like, oh, I'm going to go start training, because that's really what it was. I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to, you know what I mean, be a fighter. Yeah. So the transition was, it, it was weird, man, you know, but that, that stuff... You know, it was always, it was always in my blood. Fighting was always a big part of, of who I was. You know, like when I was five, six years old, man, I was in full contact karate tournaments, taekwondo tournaments. Uh, that shit, like, really, like, it comes from from way back. Like, I, I, my family's from Rome, so uh, you know, I always, I always tell people, man, like, I could, I could feel it. Like, I'm not the first Ricci that was like 
you know, fighting for sport or for entertainment. It's like, like Conor McGregor. Yeah, like Con Conor talks about, yeah. you know, Ireland and the, the troubled past they had, you know, and... and he, but for me, like I, I really like I have the, I have the um, the Coliseum tattooed on my arm. Yes, yeah, so I saw you in the gym yesterday. I didn't realize how many tattoos you had. Yeah, and I, and the reason why is my family's from Rome, and like I truly feel like like the name Ricci was like I feel like it was represented before. It was like someone, one of my ancestors fought in that arena. I can like I just know it. It's it's in our blood, man. We. We've always, my whole family, like, we're fiery, man. We all have fight in us, and, and it, fighting always called to me, you know. Like, when I was done with Taekwondo and karate, I got into, you know, I was in, going through high school, and I was fighting all the time. Where did you go to time. high school? James Lane. Okay. So, I was, like, just, I was fighting all the time. In high school? Yeah, high school, elementary school. Like, the area I grew up in, man, like, you'd have to fight for your bike. Like, right. You'd have to fight for your running shoes. You ever have your, someone try to steal your running shoes? Like... You know, like it's, and in high school, like people would try to steal your lunch money, even your lunch, man. Like you go and buy buy a pizza and like leave the, the, the store and someone be like, "Yo, give me your give me your fucking pizza." Yeah, it's your bus pass, like man. And I was fighting all the time. Would you say because you said you considered yourself a bit of a loner? Would you say that your way of expressing yourself was through your fighting? When I, someone maybe pick on you, I, I feel I feel like I, I, I'm creative, you know. And artistic and I, I feel like that that's definitely my my outlet you know but I, I just for me to say like I feel like fighting's in my blood and it it, it, it must be been like that for, for centuries like the, the like I never ever back down from a fight ever in my life you know even if I got beat up like anybody tried to take something that was mine anyone tried to hurt me or, or one of my friends or you know I was and these fights man they piled up they piled up quick but, uh, so Saint Laurent, you must have a couple of KOs. I was, I, by the time I was eighteen, I was banned from most of the clubs in, in the city. You know. So you weren't a head case. You just. I, I mean, I wasn't. No, I wasn't the kind of guy who was like, "I'm going to go out and fight tonight." Yeah. But I was never one to back down from one either. You know. So uh, they piled up quick, and, and when I was like 16, 17 years old, I was already six foot, six one. Yeah, 180, 185. You know, I was a, I was already like a like this. Like a, yeah, I was a man at that age. So for me, like I, to, to fight somebody who was 25, 30, I didn't care. You know, right. somebody would bother me or my friends. It, you know, I'd fight, and uh, it, it, it transpired. You know, all all the way into my training. When I started training MMA, like it, 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 that's why I fought amateur so fast and I fought pro so fast. You know, like it when I you. when I fought my first pro fight, I only had three amateur bouts. And I wanted to fight pro so bad that I started arguing with Faraz in the gym. Oh. And I was like, I want to fight pro. And he's like, oh, you know, like, let's take a few more amateur fights. And I was like, no. I'm like, you think I'm fucking scared? Like, I'm not scared of anybody. Like, I want to fight. I want to fight pro now. And he, like, looked at me and he just smiled, you know. And, like, looking back at it now, I, I think he, he knew that when I stepped up to him, he knew I was ready. Do you think that would fly with someone in the gym today? I don't think no so. No way. No way. But... We had a, a, that kind of a dynamic, you know. Because you were there from the beginning, yeah. the get-go. You were like his son. He saw grow up, throwing you into the pros. It was yeah. like watching your child go to school for the first time. Yeah, and, and he like, he really like, I think when I stepped up and he saw I was stepping into my own. Yeah. You know, and he, he was like, all right, man, we're going to do this then, you know. Because I don't think talent was the issue. I think maybe he was looking for me to mature, you know, and what my attitude was like, so... But you were only going to mature in the cage. That, that, that's right, you know, but he, he, he knew I was ready. He knew I was, you know, mentally I was there. So the, the, the whole transition into training was, was quite easy. The whole transition into fighting, from training to fighting, was, was also easy. Like, everything happened for me very quick. You know, I sit back and I talk to Rory and he's like... I've been training for 12 years now. Yeah, you know? 14 or something? Yeah, yeah, like he's so... And uh, I'm like, oh, well, I've only been training for eight. You know? He's like, fuck, man, you've gotten so good so fast. Like, fighting is just so natural to me. You know? Right. So so the transition and getting into TriStar Gym was, uh, was good, but it also turned a lot of things around for me. Like, I stopped getting into fights, you know? I stopped getting into trouble. Or discipline. You already had your outlet that day. Exactly. Like I, you know, and as I got older, these these problems I was getting into, you know, I started to run into, you know, problems with the law and, and stuff like that. And I remember, like, the last time I got arrested, 
I was in I was in a holding cell for two days, three days, and I remember I got released from this holding cell. It was in Saint Laurent, Timmins, which is, yes, which is not far from the gym. And I was like, bring me to Pizza Hut. So I went to Pizza Hut at the Carry Square, and then My I man. and then I left the Pizza Hut and I drove to the gym. And wow, Ross was there, and I was like, all right. And I started hitting pads. Did you tell him what happened. No, I didn't. Does I didn't he know do- now? <laughs> now he knows. Yeah. Okay. You fought in North Carolina in your previous yeah. fight. You had to do two weigh-ins, correct, before the yeah, fight? Yeah, that was... What's up with that? They have this rule that you can't gain more than 13 pounds. Now, they weigh, so they weigh you in on Friday and then they or Thursday, and then they weigh you in Friday morning at like 9 a.m. You can't have gained more than 13 pounds. Now, that's an issue for me. I rehydrate up to like 178. Yeah. 180. And they said I couldn't be more than 169. 169. So, yeah, so I spent, after dehydrating myself, I made 56 quite easy at that time, so yes. thank God for that. But um, I couldn't really re- fully rehydrate. So, like, I had to, like, watch what I was eating. I was eating, like, spinach salad and chicken annoying. breast. Like, it was super annoying. And then I woke up, and I was still, like, 171. So, like, I had to get back on the treadmill and, like... A fighter will tell you, you know, one weight cut is enough, you know, and Absolutely. and you have to do everything you can to recover from that. To wake up in the morning and have to sweat out another two pounds on the treadmill, it sucked. And, like, Sotaropoulos made the weight in the morning, and then I was, like, on the treadmill, like, sweating, and he was walking by looking at me, like, smiling, like, you know. Did he uh, purposely miss weight the first time so that he could just make it straight off the second? Or if you missed the first, the second wasn't uh, an, an option even? No, if you if you if you miss the second weight cut, yeah, you you have time to to lose the weight, right? It's same with the first one, right? Okay. You miss it, you have time to. So when I woke up in the morning, I said, okay, let's see what I weigh. I was one seventy one, so I had to go to the treadmill, sweat, come back and make the weight. So, uh, but it was annoying, and it, and it, it played with me a little bit, you know. Like I felt like I had Sotaropoulos hurt in that fight like four or five times. Absolutely, but. I really didn't like want to jump all over him no. because I I didn't know how my body was going to react from the second weight cut. So, which it was only two pounds, but I had to spend the the, the day before still temporarily dehydrated. Right. So I, I I set a pace and I was like I'm going to stay true to this pace and if he falls he falls if he doesn't he doesn't. Right. So I feel it took away from me a little bit, but I still put on you know one of the best performances I've had. Absolutely. And uh, he showed up ready. Like this guy was like. He looked better than ever. You know, he was super fit, yes. super lean. Yeah, uh, he was aggressive and he didn't quit, man. Like I, I couldn't walk the next day from kicking him in the face so much. Like yeah. my foot was like this. Wow. You know, so I can imagine his face like he. Yeah, because super tough. Uh, he's had a lot of experience in the UFC and post UFC as well. You know, you're a post UFC guy too, but you're more of a young blood, so he really had something to prove against you and. You actually taught him a very good lesson. Yeah, like like I didn't really realize it was it was that big of a win till I till I spoke to Faraz. Faraz said, "Mike, like this guy's a true veteran. He's yeah. a really good guy. He's Absolutely. like, and you made him look like he didn't belong in there. You made Absolutely. him look like an amateur. So it's not necessarily that I beat him; it's how I beat him. You know? Yeah, he was floating around the uh, the title contention for a while, and then it just didn't work out for him, and now. You know, you took care of business. The issues I had with my weight, my last fight, um, I think it was, you know, when I fought Sotaropoulos, I fought him at the end of August, and then I, I took a couple weeks off, and then I found out I was fighting in six weeks. So, I, you know, the fluctuation, you know, with my weight, I think really uh, took its toll. Uh, I dropped, and I popped back up, right. and then I tried to drop again, and I think it was too soon. My body didn't really reset, so... The whole weight loss process throughout the camp was a grind, you know, and I was always two pounds behind schedule. Like, I know my body well. I've made weight multiple times, and, uh, you know, I'd be like, oh, I should be 174 right now, but I'm 176. Oh, I should be 171, but I'm 173. Like, that two pounds followed me the whole camp. Right. And then when I when I started my actual weight cut, I started to lose weight really fast, and I was like, okay, I'm going to get up to schedule. Yeah. But two days before the weigh-in, I, I, I actually gained weight. Like, I gained a pound overnight, and I was like, oh, like it, it just didn't seem right. My body just didn't feel, it didn't feel right. I was just holding on to everything, you know, literally like water and chicken breast. Okay. And so I was like, all right, well, I got I to gotta tough it out. I got I to gotta lose this, this weight. So um, I started to sweat, and I started from, from about 
two, three pounds higher than normal. Okay. And sure enough, when I got to the end, the two, three pounds just wouldn't come off. So we figured, you know, like, all right, like, you know, this happens, so now we got to deal with it. It's going to be a health issue potentially if I lose the, two, the extra two pounds. Right. So instead, we'll, we'll, we'll miss the weight, we'll, we'll take the, you know, we'll give up 20% of our purse, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll still fight. You know, we yes. felt that after the weigh in, when we got into the cage and fought, the result of the fight would be what everybody remembered, not the missed weight you know what I mean I completely agree so it would have been oh Yoshida knocked Mike out or Mike knocked Yoshida out or someone got submitted yes. like, it wouldn't have been like oh I remember that two pounds so we, we thought it would be you know it, it was just a small bump in the road but right. the following day with Yoshida you know pulling out like six hours before the fight it just it blew up what happened you know what I mean yes the weight issue became huge because I was like alright when the fight's over no one will talk about the weight but the fight never happened so all we're talking about now is the weight. Right. But we offered that guy like the moon and stars, man. We gave we offered him everything. Like the day of, he said, I don't want to fight Mike, he's too big. So Frass was in the room with him and the owners of Titan and they were like, Alright, we're gonna bring Mike down to your room, we're gonna weigh him in in front of you. you then you can say whether you wanna fight or not. And he's like, Oh well it's not that, you know, uh, it's not for a belt anymore, so I don't wanna do it. So they called the commission. They said, could we switch it to a welterweight bout and have it, you know, five rounds and for a title? The commission said, no problem. They signed off on it. So, wow. Yeah. Well, because we both were under 170. So technically, what's yeah, the difference? Of course. Right? Absolutely. So uh, they're like, okay, you got your five round fight. You got your belt. And then he was like, oh, well, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. And Frost was like, well, you know what? You guys must be the best negotiators ever because when I get up to walk out, you're going to say, wait, wait, wait. If you guys pay me this, I'll fight. He says, so if it's about money, what do you guys want? Like, literally, we're, they were willing to pay them anything. So you went to hell and back with trying to get this fight. And fine. he just didn't want to do it. I mean, you know, I can't really say if I missed weight or made weight, would he have still fought? But I really have a feeling that, that Yoshida really just didn't want this fight. I don't know if it was the flight, you know, flying 24 hours, you know, while cutting weight. And if he didn't feel good or what the case may be, if he was hurt, sick. But no one stopped him from getting in the cage but himself. Absolutely. No, so. I, I completely agree. And it's a disappointing thing when you put in all that hard work and effort and you literally have your coach trying to go to bat for you to make the fight happen in any way possible. He really he really tried, man. Do, for you, us, like, do you think that Yoshida didn't want to take the fight at welterweight in case, not saying he would have won, and then would have then had to defend it against future welterweights? Do you think that had to do with it? I mean, because if have, you're big, he if could he's have, scared he, of you, he could have vacated the belt. He could have won and just and stepped back and said, "I'm moving down away," and the title would have became vacant. It's true. You're you know? absolutely so right. So I don't think that that was the issue. Um, I really, I've been in a lot of fights, man. I've had almost 20 pro fights. Like I, I really got this feeling off Yoshida. I saw him the day of the fight. I saw him in the lobby, and I, I looked at Crew Ash and I said, "Man." This guy doesn't want to fight, you know? And, like, I was very surprised that somebody with so many fights seemed so nervous. He had such a nervous energy around him. Right. And I, I just... Something seemed off with him. And I was like, you know what, man? This guy's going to get it tonight. Like, he's just not... He's not, he's not there. I, w I, was, I felt it, you know? I was in the zone, and, like, I just didn't feel the same type of energy coming from him. And sure enough, he just... He backed out. I don't right. know what it was, but he must have not felt right, you know? Uh, or, you know, the fight day is a, it's nerve wracking fight day. You wake up and man, I, I'm nervous too. I'm scared. Like I'm getting sure, into a cage sure. tonight. Like this is no joke. But I overcome that fear, you know, and I and I and I fight. I think maybe, you know, he, you know, fight day jitters came and he just really just shut down, man. You know, he just didn't want to deal with it. I mean, I don't really see another reason why he wouldn't get in there if he was offered a belt and more money plus twenty percent of my purse and. I the really cards don't. were in his stacked in his favor, yeah. and you were still willing to take the fight. You would have fought with one glove if they told you. Yeah, not I would to have. I would have fought you know? Yoshida for free. Yeah. So I mean, why didn't he fight? It was internal. It was definitely internal. For it had sure. something to do with him. For so. sure. Um, wow. Um, really made a difference. Having Shane Carwin as a coach, how was that? Shane's an awesome guy, man. Super smart. You know, he's an engineer. Like. He was really fun to be around. Like, he, 
and he, he didn't really coach us as much as the other guys did, but he had that like that like father vibe to him. You know, right. It was like the, everyone's dad, you know. Yeah. So it was cool to be around him and and whatnot. The coaches that I, I connected with the most were definitely Pat Barry and, and Trevor Whitman. Right, I was going to ask you about those yeah. two guys. Pat Barry's a very personable person, very emotional, yeah. sensitive, yeah. funny as hell as well. Mm -hmm. But somebody that you could uh, take something from when you're trapped in that environment. So right. having a guy like Pat to take the, some steam off must have been very fulfilling for you at the end of the day. I fed off him, man. Like at one point, he, he they, they they made him leave for like two or three weeks, and he came back like four days or three or four days before I fought Neil in the semifinal. Wow. When I saw him walk in the gym, like wanted to hug him. I just like it. It just I had this surge of energy, man. That's and they great. were like, "All right, Neil, you and Mike are fighting, so we got to split up the coaches." I was like, "You can pick whoever you want. I'm taking Pat. You pick your three, and then I'll take whatever's left." Like I just wanted to have Pat there. You know what yeah. I mean? And man, that warm up of that fight, like we put on MMA gloves and we were just fighting in the locker room, like not, we weren't stretching and doing activation stuff. Like we literally just were fighting. We broke a huge sweat, like, gladiator style. We were going at it, and then they're like, "All right, you guys are up," and like we just walked out. And I was raring, you know, to go. So it, having Pat Barry there was 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 a good experience for me, man. One of the coaches I connected with the most, for sure. Do you have any contact with Pat now? Yeah, for sure. I still have his number. And, wow. You know, I have him on Twitter, and we text each other stuff. And like, uh, you know, he, he'll post like he's, uh, you know, posted dumb videos of me where he's like imitated me and stuff. Oh, and really? That yeah, must yeah. be pretty funny. Yeah, actually. where he like combs his hair to the side. Oh, okay. And walks around with a glass of wine. And okay. He's making fun of me. Okay. And stuff, so he's a cool dude. Him and Tr and Trevor, man. Trevor's a really great coach. He, he you know, he's coaching uh, Gagey right now. Yeah. World Series of Fighting Champion. Who's looking really good. So. He's a great coach as well, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you have a guy like Pat Barry, his, uh, his fiance, Thug Rose. Yeah. Uh, I've met her a few times. Yeah? He brought her to the, to the Ultimate Fighter House. That's cool. Yeah, she's an intense character herself. Yeah. But uh, how would it feel for you, for your resurgence back into the UFC, to have Thug Rose on the card, and then you walk into the arena, and Pat's just like, Mike, my man, let's do this. <laughs> That'd be a huge deal for you. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, like the first time I met Rose, he, he brought her to the house and we we had a morning workout, so Pat was going to run us through that workout. So I got there and he's like, all right, guys, like, let's get together. And I'm like, oh, like I'm wrapping my hands, you know, and he's like, like come on, like, you know, hurry up. I was like, oh, man, sorry, I got to wrap my hands. And she just like leaned over and she was like, he should have wrapped his hands when he woke up. Like, <laughs> and that's like her mentality. You yeah, know? Like she's, yeah. She's so intense. Like, I was late for class. I'm like, oh, I gotta. It's like, man, you should have fucking wrapped your hands when you woke up. Yeah. Like, before you even got here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have woke up with them on. Yeah, already. like, yeah. She, she's a super intense chick, you know? Yeah. She, she's cool, man. She's really cool. Yeah, it was interesting. I was at UFC 113, Shogun Machida, and Pat Barry was walking out of the exit, and he was holding a t-shirt, and I yelled, Pat, can I have your shirt? He said, you want my shirt? And he just threw it, and that was it. <laughs> and he just walked away nonchalantly. He's very, he knows how to work a crowd. It must have been, like I said before, a really big uh, influence on you when you're trapped in that uh, environment. It was, man. He, he was, he was really, really cool, man. He was really cool. Like, it, it had, that, like, my experience in the Ultimate Fighter would have been completely different if it wasn't for him. Wow! And how was it for you fighting Neil, a teammate? It was, uh, it, it was tough, you know. Like I, Neil was one of the guys I got I got close to, you know. And it was um, he's a nice guy. He's a nice guy, you know. And we spent a lot of time together. We trained together, and I didn't expect to fight him. Obviously, I mean, you don't really expect to fight any of your teammates. You know, it might happen, but yeah. But uh, it happened, and we cut weight together. We weighed in, we rehydrated together. Wow. You know what I mean? We, we had dinner that night. The next day we had breakfast together. Like, we swam together, and then we got in the van, drove to the arena and fought. So, how was that for you? Very odd. You would never do that again? No, it was really like, I mean, I don't see myself ever being in that situation right. again. And even though Nia wasn't like a lifelong friend, it was very odd to spend six weeks with someone and then... It was the last day we fought, so literally we spent the whole season together. Oh, we fought the day we got released. Uh, that day was it was emotional. When I finished that fight, it wasn't just the you know hurting one of my friends and and and, and that I also knew I won. 
I was going to the finale and it was the day we got released so when I walked out of that cage it was like it's over wow. give us your mic back like you, you're done yeah. like go and just go home so it was super super and it, you know getting released that day was like euphoric man it was just like the door opened to the, to the house and they were like hey go like it was I'll never forget that day man it was absolutely crazy I'll never forget that day did you go straight to the airport no, no, no. We we changed and we went out for dinner and then we went and partied and oh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, all the boys. Yeah, the and Mike few. Mike Chiesa was in town too. So like, I was partying with him a bit. I kept in touch with Mike too. He's a cool guy. Chiesa season was after yours, correct? The one right before. Right before. Yeah. Okay, I thought it so was. So because the one he after. won that, they, they kind of brought him back. Yeah, he's you know a perfect image. Yeah, yeah. example. Yeah, Chiesa is a very cool guy, yeah. and he's been setting a great example for Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. Fighters in the UFC now. Yeah, I mean his story, you know, with like his father passing and leaving, come back. You know, it, it was a great story. So they brought him back, and that day was something else, man. I remember like Pat like brought bottles of champagne and wow. he, like stuffed them in the bag and. We have like a fridge in the, the locker room, right? The training room. And it's full of like NOS and like whatever. We like stuffed all the champagne there. So like then we finished and we were all like drinking. In the locker and, room. Yeah, in the locker That's room. Great. It was like everyone was in party mode. should have got that on film. That would have been <laughs> cool. Mike was popping bottles. It was, it was nice, man. It was a, it was a fun, fun day. That's cool. Because yeah. um, in the UFC, you didn't have one weak opponent. All your opponents were tough. Um, maybe not now that you look back on it, right. um, because uh, you know you've grown as a fighter and in terms of your uh, preparation and the way you get ready for a fight and you handle it. But you know when you're training for a guy like Colin Fletcher, it must be difficult. Yeah, because you're not going to sure. find a sparring partner like him, and no. you're also um, you never know what you're going to get from the UK fighters. Right. If he's going to scrap. He was he was super tough, had a great chin, you know, was very awkward and tall. Also, he was like six foot three, like he was huge. Yeah. And, um, but I, I did have, a, have a, you know, a lot of tough fights in the UFC throughout tough and, and all that stuff. Like, For sure. Uh, but Magny I feel like is I've, on a five fight win streak yeah, now. But I feel like, a, a, you know, I've, I've been, been doing well. Like if you include the ultimate fighter, Right now, I've I've gone eight and two in my last ten fights. For know? sure. So, uh, and those two losses, you know, one came at welterweight in the finale, and the other one was a close split decision to Miles Jury, who's ranked number eight in the world right now. You know, so with that being said, like my only loss in, in the lightweight division since 2011 has been to Miles Jury. Right. You know, so I, I don't feel like, but the way that my scheduling's worked out and. You know, the way they, they didn't count the show, it just kind of seems like my record is a little bit shaky, you know. But but I've only lost two of my last ten fights. One and, and the only lightweight loss I've had in my last ten fights has been to the number eight guy in the world. Yeah. So, you know, I really feel like I, I belong in the UFC. I feel like that's where, where I should be. But, um, you know, the the mistakes I made, you know, the and the mental errors, I think they yes. were really... I don't think they were that bad like I didn't get knocked out and I was you know getting my ass whooped yeah. round after round but the mental errors I made you know landed me in this place and and there's a lot of you know there's a business side to it too like when I got out of the Ultimate Fighter House these guys you know the UFC they, they gave me big fights they, they put me on the main card in the G GSP fight um, you know the John Jones Gustafson card I fought a Miles Jury like these were big fights they put me in. They they didn't want to have me around to be some undercard fighter. Were full stadium fights. Yeah, and and both pay per view events. Yeah. And, um, you know the performances I gave them. You know they were. It was almost like you know it was like a, a slap in the face. Like I, I, it seemed like I didn't care. Like I didn't appreciate what was happening. So they had to make a, a judgment call. You know. Uh, with that being said, like I think I've made the, the necessary changes now. You know I feel like. I could be a big asset to the UFC. You know? yeah. I feel like um, active striker. I don't have a, a tremendous output where I throw 150 strikes around. Right. But every single punch or kick that I land has an effect on my opponent. For sure. You know. So, and it was like that in the UFC too. I, when I was in tough or or, or my my fight against Fletcher or Dre, like I, I never had a super high output. But when I landed my strikes, I caused damage. You know. But I was a little bit, you know. 
I was in old first or second gear in the UFC. Now with Titan, it's like, you know, I'm out there and I'm looking, I'm hunting. You know, I'm a whole different fighter. Yeah, your Muay Thai has taken a whole nother level in terms of your elbows. And when they close yeah. the distance on you, they pay for it. Yeah. They pay like for it. Is, we, we've really, like, my Muay Thai is starting to evolve a lot. Man. And I and I had, a, I had to improve so much from the Sadaropoulos fight to the Yoshida fight, which was only two months apart. I was dying, dying to get after him, man. I had so much I was going to... Like, I was so mad Sadaropoulos survived that fight. Like, I was going to put Yoshida away no matter what. Right. Or I was going to be crawling out of the ring because I was exhausted, you know, from, from trying to kill this guy. Right. So, it didn't transpire, but, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time, man. It really is. And, and, and I know that, you know... I speak to the UFC and I, I speak to Joe Silva. I don't hound him with emails every day, but I've no. spoken to him. You know, I spoke to him after the Sadaropoulos fight and let him know where I was at. Told him he was I, probably very impressed with the yeah, fight. Yeah, for sure. He's, you know, he said you're looking good. Keep doing what you're doing and, and whatever. So, but I'm not trying to force anything. No, you know? for sure. If it happens, it happens, and I, I'm sure it's only a matter of time. For sure. What should he put his body through? Right. You know? What does it mean to you to be a champion? in terms of a champion of a promotion. Maybe not necessarily the UFC, but what did it mean to you really to hold the belt for Titan FC? Honestly, like, belts never really meant that much to me, to be honest with you. I was always more about the fight, you know? But at the same time, that, that got me into a lot of trouble too. Like, if I didn't feel like fighting, man, like, I just would show up to a fight and just kind of not really fight. Like, if I was up for it or not up for it, it, it would always show in my performance, yeah. you know? Now, I've made fighting more of a business for me. Like, I've, I don't let myself have bad days anymore. You know, right. I show up, and it's like, you got to execute. Right. And with that being said now, you know, taking this, this sport more seriously, I look at the potentials of winning belts and, and becoming a champion. And that's what I'm in this for, you know? I really feel like, you know... I. My last lightweight loss was to a guy who was in the top 10. I don't feel like if we fought again, I would lose. I'm in a whole other place right now. You know, I believe I belong in the top 10, and I believe I can beat anybody in the world. Right. Um, am I the best in the world? You know, that, that's yet to, to be yeah, yeah. It's yet to be determined, but I know I could beat anybody. I know I can hit and hurt anyone. So... For me, the ultimate goal is, is to reach the top and fight the best. Now that you're, um, now that you're signed with Titan, mm -hmm. where do you see yourself at the end of 2015? Where do you see Mike Ricci? I'm looking for one more big fight. I think that my next big fight, my next performance, is going to get me back into into the UFC. At the end of 2015, I think that I'll be on on the cusp of getting a top 10 fight again in the UFC. Wow. That's my, my prediction. I feel like it happened for me very fast when I first got into the UFC. Yeah. And I don't see it happening any other way when I get back there. So your first fight in the UFC, hypothetically, you believe that it will be a quality opponent? Or yeah, I'm looking for tough guys. Yeah. So I think with that being said, when I get back to the UFC, they're gonna, they know. Joe Silva, you know, he's the best matchmaker in the world. He knows caliber of a fighter that I am. I yeah. know he's not going to give me some guy that, that has no fights or, you know what I mean, his first fight in the UFC. It's not going to happen. I've already put on UFC gloves seven times, man. You know, f you know, four times in the house and three times outside of the house. It's not unfamiliar to me. Curran is, uh, he's a guy I'd like to fight, but I don't think he'll ever take the fight against me. Either. Right. I'd like to get back to the UFC and get in a position where I can be a big enough name to call out Pat Curran, you know, and have some sort of fight happen, have him signed by the UFC. You know Specifically I mean? for Mike Ricci. I was thinking about that before I fought Jerry, you know. I, I wanted to, to get my hands on current again. I want to show the world look, what should have happened the first time, you know. Anyway, if it ever transpires or not, it's, it's you know, that's up to God. But uh, for me, Jerry and Curran are the only guys that have fight again. Absolutely. Completely all access, uncut, <laughs> shared stories that promise we're not said before yeah appreciate the time definitely going to see you around the gym hopefully i see you around montreal and uh we're still banking on you to get that mcdonald's sponsorship so whenever <laughs> it happens man let us know all right thanks adam thanks, thanks man. that was a great interview thank you